<laughs> Are you live? I think I am live. Can you see me? <laughs> I can see you. Uh, I'm admitting everyone right now. Uh, I have a nice group of folks. Hi, everyone. We're here with Shoshana Weinberger in our Thursday series of live studio visits, artist talks through Art Fair. I'm Carolina Wheat. And I'm really excited that um, you guys are joining us this evening. It's a beautiful spring day in New York. I know, uh, Shoshana, you're in Newark. I'm in it's Newark. pretty much the same yeah. over across the river. Beautiful, beautiful day. <laughs> really cool. Well, we're fortunate enough to have Shoshana tonight in her studio because it's so close to your home. Yeah. Not all of us have the luxury of going to and from our studio right now. So uh, we're really in for a great treat. Uh, Shoshana Weinberger, if you don't already know, is one of the legacy members on Art Fair. And uh, she's really graced us with her work and her incredible history uh, as a Jamaican born, uh, identifying Jamaican artist who's been growing up in the States uh, after she moved from Kingston, Jamaica. She's won numerous grants. Uh, we may need to ask you how you get those grants <laughs> and awards and fellowships. Uh, currently the, uh, at MICA as the uh, uh, endowed oh, chair. Endowed in chair in painting. Actually just finished, just finished. Just finished. This Monday, this past Monday. Sunroom Project uh, artist at Wave Hill. Uh, you received your BFA from School of the Art Institute of Chicago and your MFA from Yale. Uh, Shoshana, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, opening your studio to us. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, thanks. I'm, I'm currently at Project for Empty Space. Uh, I was a artisan resident here, uh, 2000. Oh gosh, 2017 and 18, I uh, had a show uh, at, our, at the old location, which was just kind of a block away. And then uh, Project for Empty Space scored a really beautiful building uh, with private studios. And so a lot of it's New York based artists, New Jersey based, some Brooklyn, some Jersey City. And um, this is like the first time in years that I've uh, been able to um, walk to my studio uh, 20 years without one um, and actually when I was working with the students at MICA they are all home um, no school some of them are seniors graduating and they're sort of distraught that they don't have their studio and I said you know during wartime during wartime periods artists make some of the most amazing work and the fact that we can be creative anywhere is um, you know is the most important thing um, to keep us resilient. So uh, it's a real gift. I just want to um, cut in yeah. real quickly, Shoshana, because it looks like your Instagram live is not live yet. Oh no. That's okay. Checking connection. Okay, am I now? <laughs> am I yes, now? you are. I oh, see. hello. Okay. I have to do this all over again. Troubleshooting team. Eh, they'll catch up. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about all those. Oh, so, yes. So I'm in the studio space. It's um, it's really nice. I you know put my gloves and all my PPE on, and I come over here uh, and get a chance to work. Uh, everything's been postponed uh, in life. So actually, Wave Hill. I just um, spoke to uh, Eileen Young um, Lynch, and she runs the Wave Hill Sunroom Project, and I it's actually been postponed to 2021. So uh, as of uh, yesterday, I found that out. So, um, so life is all about, you know, kind of in a holding pattern, right? As we all are kind of put in the corner <laughs> for bad behavior. So, um, but it's been really good because this time period for me has been about like reflection and looking at older work since I don't have a lot of deadlines anymore. So it's been really interesting to um, kind of go through things from SAIC. <laughs> And sort of like look at the work that I've been doing over these years and seeing how it's changed or how it's like really similar, some connections. So, um, yeah. yeah, you can see some of your, um, you know, some work that's eight, seven years old on the Art Fair app. And yeah. um, it, it, it's still in conversation with the, some of the work that you're creating now, of course, yeah. yet uh, 
it is really a great moment right now to reflect on the works that uh, you have made. And as you're moving into this new phase of making you know, no deadlines, no, no student responsibilities, only, only you and your studio during this self-reflective and, and isolating time. And I'm really curious to, to learn a little bit more about what's happening behind you over there, Shoshana. Oh, okay. Yes. And I've rigged up this, this like dolly thing. So it's like, a, well, like in a Spike Lee movie right now. I'm like kind of going like, I should have music or like jazz. Anyway, um, oh, I put up one of the ones that are, that's uh, on the art fair site. And um, basically right now I'm working on collage and just like really plain. Um, I kind of, because I don't have a deadline, I'm sort of like thinking about um, material and just um, sort of a new, Kind of syntax, visual syntax, um, incorporating with watercolor, but then also the syntax of the barcode or the um, sort of the zebra stripes, um, which is kind of evident in like some of the larger works here. Like uh, these sort of zebra stripes are um, reminiscent of like barcodes and I and identity, and so thinking about that in my own and being called like an Oreo or a zebra, growing up when in the states and um, thinking about that as a sort of an identity marker. Uh, and so right now I'm working on a series of these collages that, and I'll bring them to you just so it's easier. But I'm doing like these cutout collages now um, where I'm kind of just letting the material, letting watercolor just do its thing and then like leaving and coming back. So it's like kind of like a science project, like a scientific project, <laughs> like going back and just letting just letting it, letting the water absorb, letting the colors just sort of play and not being as illustrative as I sometimes am. And then using collage and cutouts um, to kind of create that syntax. And so this is actually cut out paper and then I'm making my own collage paper during this time. Um, so that's been really fun. Um, and I would, so you would say that a lot of the some of the work that you're doing right now with the wet and wet watercolor and um, a, a more loose kind of um, illustrative work, not non illustrative, but loosely associated uh, is part of your some of your response to experimenting during this time. It's correct. Like, yeah, I mean, this is like, I mean, it's everything's on hold. It's like I can work from my studio if I wanted to. I have a full-time job and thankfully I still have that job. <laughs> I don't know, next week, we're not sure if it's gonna be furlough news, but you know, so it's like, I have this time to like really focus on like what I'm making. And it's sort of like nice to take a break from the work that I have been making for the past 10 years, which is two series, the Strange Fruit series and the Invisible Visibility series, which started in uh, at uh, Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans. I was a one of the first 10 artists in residence there um, after I got my grant from Joan Mitchell. And uh, you know, it, it was that, that time where I kind of had a breakthrough and it's sort of similar to this time, like it's been eight weeks <laughs> and I had like a two month residency. So in some cases I'm like using this sort of quarantine time as like my own sort of initiated um, re artist residency. And I'm sort of like fueling it based on some rules. So like I'm working with water-based paper, I'm working with collage. I am trying to see if I can break through some ideas or incorporate them into this, what seems like ongoing series of, of invisible visibility and then the, um, the strange fruit series. And, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's been really wonderful to kind of play with that, those, those visual syntaxes and kind of pull from like my mute, the muses that I use. I have uh, Strange Fruit herself. Um, I have Dandelion. So there's about, there's about 20 muses that are archetypes for, for myself um, or for certain women, certain uh, female uh, types in history. And I kind of use those. So I kind of, I sort of approach my studio practice as a visual anthropologist. Um, I kind of take my experiences and then turn those images into sort of specimens, uh, specimens of memory and reflection. Um, and also as someone who's intersectional in terms of, you know, being biracial, being from Jamaica, 
um, also religiously sort of like, uh, you know, Jewish and Christian, but I don't identify. So this idea of like being peripheral um, and the idea of double consciousness. So like, so in, when I go home to Jamaica, I'm not Jamaican enough. When I'm in America, I'm exoticized. <laughs> and then I'm also Shoshana Weinberger, but I'm not um, Jewish. So it's like this periphery that I'm sort of always on the edge of. And so that kind of ambiguity is something that I'm playing with with the work. So in many cases, there are no uh, identifiable eyes or or mouths or lips, or there's multiple mouths and uh, multiple legs, multiple breasts. So I'm kind of like playing on that idea of like female beauty and, uh, and then and multiplicity and then ambiguity. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I haven't seen anybody in weeks and I was like. <laughs> well, it's, it's really deep and entrenched uh, in your own personal upbringing and it's got such a personal reflection to the work where there's, you know, boundaryless or, you know, the other and understanding where you fit within this, you know, this or that, uh, which I kind of love the uh, metaphor of these loose lines of the wet on wet uh, watercolor that you're working with right now kind of fits really nicely in that idea. But how, you know, you addressed early on in this statement uh, using uh, references such as barcodes or the black and white as zebra and, and other types of racially charged um, references, you used, used the word Oreo and other things like, um, can, the work is informed also by your femininity and the muse. Can you show us around a little bit of some of the references and uh, symbolism that you may use that may not be as obvious about these? Oh yeah, sure. In terms of like body types and hair. So like yeah. hair, the criteria for, for beauty um, and especially like in America, but then also in African-American uh, culture, but then also in Jamaican culture, the idea of like good and bad hair. Um, and so that's referenced in the work, uh, and sometimes it's a silhouette. Uh, let me see if I can bring you guys around without. <laughs> I, I, this was like, I was working on this today. You know, this, it's a little shaky, but here we go. Well, you're the um, first uh, person that we've interviewed uh, and engaged with that has actually used the goose neck uh to its advantage I have to this too sorry guys on instagram I'm well, well it's it's quite impressive shoshana because usually we, we had partners or friends of the artist running around with the instagram so this is I, I'm, I'm kind of a control freak so this yeah. would be a good situation i definitely need to you know gooseneck and yeah you know, so <laughs> but um in terms of like the the work and thinking about the ideas of beauty but like kind of like really bringing it back to material so like just like teeth like teeth and lips are really prevalent uh in the work like i have this uh one sort of it's also part of a muse but crooked teeth she comes up a lot and so this made with basically a hole punch so kind of playing around with the idea of like play and then using material that you know one could readily um get i mean i'm all about like portability and like being able to not be tied down to a studio or be able to work um you know anywhere i think that's really important um and so kind of playing around with that idea like i could take this home and work at it work on it as well um but the idea of like playing around with hair and the sort of like creating this other world as alien so thinking about alien identity thinking about um that that kind of what that means right now um being other and otherness um and then the idea of you know the the figure um, sort of coming out of the material so that the, the actual, not really, the areas that I'm using that are blank are sort of identified as the, as the body itself. So I don't know if that answered your question. But. Yeah, I, I was just hoping to get a, a gander and for all of us to see a, more of the work on, on the walls. And in yeah. reference to some of your symbolism, uh, you know, I wonder like what the kind coils, of like the, the coils, like the hair coils. So this is about like braids, but then also, you know, hair is like, it's on your head. It's a crown, but it's also, it's also related to like di 
digestion and how you see yourself and, and the body. So it's like also coiled, but then brains. Also thinking about like dreadlocks, thinking about co uh, maybe plaiting up my hair every night and how that ties into things. But then also the gold in here is about commodity. So like women as commodity or, or um, you know, femininity related, related to like, um, um, oh, consumerism. Or being consumed so so these are sort of what these are about and then of course the stripes um, really kind of loving this this is all sort of hand cut so it's actually not one whole piece of paper it's all cut out pieces of paper to make a whole piece so it's really kind of thinking about the idea of like survey and surveying um, bodies legs lips and like kind of making them into this sort of Frankensteinian um, collage yeah so do you, do you find your viewers um, able to connect with the work in the way that you've really given your viewers some you know references and symbols in order to help them uh understand better your vision of um the muse or your vision of otherness uh do, do you have conversations with folks about your work immediately when they when they see your work or uh I, they, they strike me as being very strong designs as well and i'm wondering whether or not uh individuals, collectors, curators engage you um, in this, you know, kind of the nitty gritty of who you are inside this very personal yet graphically aesthetic studying work. In many cases, um, a lot of the, a lot of people that view the work kind of see it as like types that they can identify with. So like they know that girl or they know that type. And some of the work that's um, actually featured on Art Fair has that, that kind of, that, that type of girl that sort of stands, like Candy Girl is sort of like, uh, she's a muse that comes up all the time. She's got sort of like awkward legs and you know, she's kind of just come out of the pool and maybe, you know, she's everything sticking. And so that's kind of me. And, you know, so I, I find that like, it's been really interesting to, meet people of all backgrounds who understand the awkwardness of adolescence and then understand the work in that way. Understand the idea that, um, you know, high heels are an accessory to beauty, right? And it also, uh, it also is something that women sort of allow to put on, but uh, for male gaze in some cases. Um, and that idea that, uh, you know, we kind of dress for others, not for ourselves in many cases. And, um, and so, th so those kinds of conversations come up um, or a relationship to my history and my background that people aren't aware of um, because of the amb ambiguity. Um, and then also, also my titles are very much a lead into my, my history and my life. So all my titles are like sentences. Um, they all relate to historical things that I've, kind of put together, or they're super funny, or they're, you know, about um, Gen X <laughs> life, or some, you know, like a uh, favorite song at certain time, and this is how I feel, uh, this is how I looked, or this is how I, you know, and so I think that the idea of like sort of being an other, and otherness, doing otherness things is something that I think a lot of people identify with that I've met. Um, you know, I've, I recently did a lecture uh, and this woman came up to me and she's Haitian and she said, boy, you know, I'm Haitian American and my grandparents in, in Haiti think I'm not Haitian enough. And so this idea that like we're all sort of peripheral and that so many people sort of imply, you know, your character type based on, you know, this sort of stereotype persona that's like driven by the media. And so um, I see that people can identify with that. And the fact that I do multiples, they're not up here, but I do multiples, which kind of allude to um, advertisements, um, pinup girls. So I have the pinup series, I have dirty bottom pinups. So I have this, I, this where I incorporate language into or onto the, the body itself um, as epitaphs for love. And so I think that there's this identity, uh, identifiable points. And in some cases, people just like the image itself and they're not, they're not concerned about that. 
about it. You know, there's some people who just gravitate to it. Um, well, I suppose a lot of folks will feel comfortable in, in the psychology of the body and the psychology of uniqueness. Uh, the work absolutely speaks to uh, that which is not often, you know, in our media. Yeah. Well, uh, marginal, and, marginalized body types. Marginalized I mean. body types, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I, I trust that, you know, there's an attraction towards not just the other, but to find themselves within the work as well, uh, which is really a fantastic feat to be able to kind of cross the boundaries in both, you know, by objectifying the other, you can still find solace within the self. Right. Uh, it's really so nice. Are you, any of your works, the, the works that you're presenting right now are all originals, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're you all. Do uh, yeah, but do you engage with uh, edition prints, or have you gone? No, I actually don't. But I, I do. Um, I do actually do. I mean, I have done printmaking. So my background uh, at SAIC, School Art Institute of Chicago, was uh, painting and printmaking, and I made books and book binding. Um, and then when I went off to graduate school, um, I did printmaking there. Was a TA. So printmaking's been, you know, really has really informed my work. Um, between undergrad and graduate school, I took six years off. And when I graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago, I got a job working as a collection manager for photography collection, LaSalle Banks Photography Collection, which is now Bank of America's photography collection. So basically, you know, had to pay the loans. <laughs> and I got this job in, in, in an art, uh, art collection. It was really amazing. And I think that, you know, looking at photography informed how my work was going to be framed and how I was going to kind of uh, draw the figure within the or a plane within the field, you know, how the work doesn't necessarily touch the edges and sort of the specimen sort of uh, survey tradition of like Berna and Hilda Becker. I love their uh, photographs, the German school of photography, which they used. Um, I, I love their water tower uh, series, which, you know, is kind of gave me this relationship between being this visual anthropologist that could um, survey like different butterflies. And so I kind of like the idea of actually doing that obsessively and making them over and over again by hand instead of using the printmaking process. So let me just show you. <laughs> this is so much fun. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I really like your, your, your. Uh... I'll show you two series. So, um, and I'll put this back on the table because I feel like it's kind of nice as if you guys are in my studio walking around with me. Um, so I'll just get over to it. <laughs> All right. So, so this series here, um, this is um, Out of Many One, which is the Jamaican Creed. Uh, Out of Many One. And um, this series was based on my strange fruit um muse and basically carolina exactly what you said like the idea of multiples but doing them by hand so that um oh i don't know if i can do this without breaking something that would be really bad but, i mean it's my stuff so this is a great view uh, can you see okay yeah. so oh good oh good just like two, oh okay that's fine Okay, so um, basically taking the muse and taking this one figure and hand, hand drawing it or hand painting it with gouache. And, you know, there's 26 of them. So each one is sort of has its own nuance and, and has its own difference. And the Strange Fruit uh, series is based on the song Strange Fruit, which uh, Billie Holiday sung she didn't write it and there's so much of like this uh <laughs> discord with that history so because abe maripol the jewish school teacher uh saw a picture of a lynching and was so taken back he wrote the poem strange fruit and one of his friends if you don't know this story i'll you know if you do great right? uh <laughs> and um so he got it in the hands of a songwriter and basically the songwriter got it in the in in the voice of Billie Holiday. And so when I read about that, I was like, oh my God, wait a minute now. I'm like, Jewish school teachers writes a poem 
and this African-American jazz singer sings it. And I'm like, I'm a strange fruit. That's my parental lineage. I'm like, I have a, you know, my dad's Jewish and my mom's Afro-Caribbean. And so he seeded this poem and my mom birthed me the strange fruit. So I kind of like took over this, this whole song title and then created a, a series that's about almost 12 years old now. So, so she was like my first muse. Um, she was sort of strange fruit became, so this is, this is in turn strange fruit. And so she shows up in so many different iterations uh, over the, over the 12 years now to the point where she's also, um, and I'll show you later, she's also a, um, a mirrored sculpture. So I think it's really interesting that, you know, some artists kind of go their lineage or go through their paths using the same muses to, to, but then play with different techniques. And so that's what I'm trying to do, like trying to like, not necessarily exhaust it because I evolve every day. So the work's evolving every day. And so that's how I see my, my studio practice. Um, and so these, I won't go through all of these, but, uh, <laughs> but some of them have like three legs, some of them have extra breasts, some of them don't have, um, don't have, um, you know, all the braids. And so there's this way of like slow read, but then it's also this way to like think about the human genos and that we're all mutations of our parents and our families uh, and the people that come before us and, you know, then thinking about like, what's going on in the world. <laughs> and so this idea that we, you know, that there are parts of us, you know, that come from one side or the other side. So sort of playing around with that and sort of being the Frankenstein, <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein in this way and creating these, um, these multiples, but then also doing it by hand. So this sort of obsessive mark making is something that I, I really like and it, it's laborious and fun and I could do it with print, <laughs> but there's something about the nuances of each one that I find sort of like each family member, you know, or a butterfly collection. So you would say that they're a series, but they're not an addition, right? They're not an addition. They're more like a, a they're more like a collection. A collection. So like, so like thinking about like cabinets of curiosity and like collections of shells or butterflies. And so that's how I'm kind of considering these, like the visual anthropologist sort of, you know, cataloging memory, cataloging bodies. Catalog Have you ever hung them all together? Yes, that's how they're hung. Ah, yes. And so, I mean, just in relationship to like retail value. So do you intend to sell it as a whole or are each for sale individually and- Each are for sale individually. Yet you present it as a whole. As a whole, because that's how I want the, the nuances to be. Uh, and I've, sold, I've sold grids away um, with, with provenance. So I know who mm -hmm. has, what, you know, um, mm -hmm. they ever, they ever want to make the grid come back again. So it's kind of like a performance piece, right? So everyone can get a little piece of it. And then, you know, if somebody summons it, they can, they can get it back. I mean, I, I've been sort of, I, I mean, I'm sort of a, I'm a grid person. Like I really love that. I, I like, I really like the modernist trope, <laughs> you know, the, the Andy Warholian, you know, soup can, you know, um, maybe not him so much, but I, I like the idea of like sort of a t owning that for myself in my own studio practice. I do know that in some cases it, it may not come up with a sale, you know, and then I have other pieces, uh, larger ones or ones that are 30 by 22 that, you know, allude to the same series and support it. So, um, you know, I think it's sort of, it's kind of part of my studio practice and I kind of like the labor of it. Yeah, it's, it's really compelling and it's a great uh, now told secret of uh, some of your process, which I appreciate this idea of reinvention. Uh, so many, you know, those aspiring artists out there in their studio today you know, have one idea and want to continue making that one idea uh, yet have, you know, a, maybe a challenge within the reinvention because they think it's dry or I've already done that. Yet the excitement in the reinvention feels so liberating when you have breakthroughs, right? You're, and it's something like looking at the works uh, in a grid that you just presented to us versus 
you know, looking at them individually, they are stronger as a whole, correct? Like just one isn't as powerful as the whole. So I just, I, I'm really curious about this, like willingness to sell just one, yet you <laughs> prefer them to be all together. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and I also have, I, I just, that was just kind of like a comment, but uh, as, as a gallerist and someone that curates, you know, work, I, I just am really fascinated by that because sometimes work is better as a whole when you have multiples in a series. Yeah. Um, Laura Splann, another incredible artist on Art Fair, has a question for you. Yes. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. <laughs> um, I'm curious about your process with the muse. Do you come to the work with a specific muse in mind, or do you use archetypes, do, or do these archetypes emerge and take form in the process of making of the work? Oh, boy. Um, I usually start out with, a, with the strange fruit muse. <laughs> but sometimes I'm, I'm just playing with material and then all of a sudden I will, uh, I will collage part of a hair or a limb or a leg and then it'll turn into another muse um, or I'll um, kind of do like I'll do um, I'll give myself criterias when in the studio, especially when there's no deadlines. And um, so I'll say like, oh, today I'm going to work with Dandelion and see what I'll do with her. So, you know, and then, and then there'll be moments where I, I make a complete mistake with something which I love and it's a new muse altogether. So, um, and also exhausting muses. So I have some muses I don't use anymore. So, and then now that's why I'm cutting them up and collaging with some, some, of my older drawings. So I've kind of taken all my older work and uh, cutting them up or like collaging with them to then utilize during this time period um, to kind of experiment and push and pull. So, but she's not always, she's not always um, the first go. I have, uh, that's a well-rounded answer. Uh, I have another question from Matthew Heberlein and Calavetti Ferguson asking, from what other artists can you draw inspiration or oh. do you draw inspiration from? Oh, Ellen Gallagher. I mean, she's just like one of my favorites. Um, back in 98 when I saw her show in London and I was just blown away or maybe it was 96. <laughs> um, I really I really could identify with her. She was one of the first artists that uh, I could identify with in terms of like same racial background, but then also like um, thinking about hair and beauty and how, how otherness is perceived um, and also her use of materiality and grid. <laughs> um, Chris Ophelia as well. Uh, his show at the New Museum a few years ago, the watercolors. I mean, I was just like, okay. So that show in 2015 was really, um, you know, really, really striking for me and, and kind of made me think about um, material, materiality a lot. Uh, so those two off the top of my head um, are, are my go-tos uh, in terms of like, um, really feeling inspiration in the studio. Uh, Carrie James Marshall's um, vacuum painting <laughs> was like the most amazing, like that portrait with vacuum. I mean, I think that that painting in his show was so, like, I just was like, wow, I want to do that. <laughs> and, you know, he's Chicago based. So and I, you know, I spent 10 years in Chicago. Um, so that's where I came of age, you know, from high school to Chicago. 91 to 2001. So it's like, I kind of have a, I mean, I studied with Chicago Imagists and, you know, I, I have that kind of Midwest mentality of like thinking about mark making and uh, not being so precious about the mark making, I think. Um, and that's something that comes out of like some of the teachers like Jim Lutz and uh, Suzanne DeRamis, uh, Ray Yoshida, like those, those are the, my teachers. And even though, you know, went off to graduate school. I, the, those like the Chicago images in the school, Jim Nutt, um, Roger Brown, like those are super influential artists for me. 
I think they are for uh, so many of us who, who <laughs> are, you know, got our, sharpened our teeth in Chicago. I mean, the only thing you can do is basically like hunker down and make work when it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and so many other reasons why um, it's a wonderful place. But one thing that I noticed you say, you know, um, the work, uh, your lines and other things may not feel as precious yet. You uh, m might have to attend to this contradiction, my friend, because I saw when you turned down the camera to the beautiful, pristine portfolio with the glassine corners oh. and like a really presentable foam core folio that yes. uh, is certainly that which an art handler dreams of, or at least a curator and another gallerist would love to have work presented in. Um, I just was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit to your, yes. um, that preciousness of the work and, 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 and putting things together in such a way that helps it feel more valuable, i.e. packing. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, between the six years of undergrad and graduate school at the photography collection, I learned from a preparator how to prepare and pack work. And I've taken that, those skills with me in the studio. I mean, I consider the studio a lab. It's basically a lab. And so, you know, it's got order. I mean, I'm not Gerhardt Richter or anything. I mean, there's, there, it's dirty. Don't worry. Um, you know, but I mean, definitely like if I'm going to, if I'm going to present something and give it to a, give it to a curator like I want and a the preparator I, I, they need to know how it's going to look how tall I want it how high I want them how the grid needs to go um, and also presentation because this is like this is this is like my livelihood so I need it to look and be in great condition so that it's a sellable item that you know this is a for sale this is a for-profit business so <laughs> so like you know, it's a business too, and it's a brand, it's me. Um, <laughs> so down to like making, you know, portfolios, slip cases, um, hinging. Uh, I also do my own um, framing. I mean, I don't actually frame, I, I get frames from the dumpster or from the local store. And then I'll miter and choroplast. And I like learned how, I, I went and did, I did a show and I spent a lot of money getting five or six frames done. And I studied how, how the framer did it. And I was like, oh, this is easy. It's strainers and coreplast, and I can get one of those. I looked up what I could get. And so basically I'm making all my frames uh, and you know, float mounting, I don't mat, no way. No way, but you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's kind of, I'm there. I'm, what can I do? What can, what do you need from me? And so it's like the curator has skills. I have skills. Uh, I'm not going to just send something and it's like, what is this? <laughs> she packed her underwear with this. It's like, there's no bubble wrap. Uh, bubble wrap's bad. Anyway. So, but um, it's part of like the professionalism that I, you know, I want people to work with me again. And so with that, as a be, being an artist that can be, you know, particular, but also, you know, bring, bring the right, bring the, bring the work to the, to the gallery it whole. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, really important, these professional practices that we, you know, certainly want to talk about your work, yet the presentation of your work um, is, integral to whether or not someone sometimes asks you back to a show or buys from you again. And yeah. um, I, I really appreciate your attention to that detail. Uh, how would you go about recommending to any artists that are on here today to, you know, learn some of these skills or like, I, I, you know, maybe it's a gradual process of trial and error, or perhaps is there some place like maybe get like a quick freelance art handling job or, you know, is, is there, what kind of way do you think folks could actually learn this? Cause we're not learning it in college. Right. No, I know. I know. We're not learning. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're not learning the business of being an artist, right? We're just getting critiqued on the work. <laughs> um, uh, you know, for me, it was just basically, I mean, just having those jobs and then uh, working for an art storage company and, and learning from people there and just, um, you know, there's a lot of good, I, mean, I don't know about a lot of good art handling books that are out there, to be honest with you, because I've only used my own skills 
and basically mimetic you know, behavior of like, oh, I'll just make a box of, or I've done bookbinding, so I'll use my bookbinding skills to make a clamshell box or to make a portfolio. But, um, but like dog ears, you know, like learning how to do the dog ears at the ends and, you know, glycine and like just getting the lingo down. Uh, I mean, anything you can find on YouTube, you know, we've got to sound like a millennial. Anyway, <laughs> just go to YouTube. Just go to YouTube. But, um, you know, I've just basically just, I think from like the, my career working for a collection and then also making kind of putting those two together have been have been a way to like learn i mean people have asked me to put on like you know a little youtube <laughs> video uh on how to like make a make a you know a, a portfolio but um, i'm just getting used to this i'm not even looking at anybody at instagram right now so <laughs> i just like definitely have to be pre-recorded but i could do it i mean you know, I, I've met other artists who work, um, who have full-time jobs in the museum industry, and you know, we collect. Maybe we'll collaborate and make. This is a perfect time, you know, to, to kind of do a little how-to step. So, yeah, it's definitely trial by error sometimes as well. Um, you never feel worse than when whomever you're delivering artwork kind of scolds you for like. You put this in a cardboard taco. There's no cover on the paint still wet. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, just observing, like just seeing like galleries that bring work to, you know, where I've worked and saying, oh, okay. All right. What's this stuff? Coraplast. Oh, okay. Is it in the dumpster? Yeah, I'm going to take some. You know, so it's like, and then doing that myself and then having the bookbinding background. So. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I really hope that, you know, we can start initiating that more in the undergraduate level of professional practices. But uh, one thing you mentioned uh, was the sculpture, the mirror, uh, almost oh, yeah. mobile that's behind you. And I have a question oh. that kind of um, uh, addresses this. Uh, from GOT, your work is great. I've seen some sculptural pieces at a few of your past shows. Are you going to continue with that medium? Yes, I am. And actually, um, uh, because of the uh, COVID, I will not be at Wave Hill, but I am making a, I'm actually taking all my body parts from my muses, and I'm making a tropical garden, sort of invisible garden, using uh, flora and fauna found in, in the Caribbean, uh, but changing it to like high heels and legs and lips. And so the so the plant life will will be evocative of, of, of female body parts. Um, and um, let me see if I can do this without like knocking over stuff. <laughs> Here, I'll just bring it over. So basically this is um, the strange fruit and I'll just bring it over here and move the camera around. And it's, it's beautiful here, by the way, just want to show Newark, Newark, there we go. First time in years I've had um, windows, which has really been uh, great. But um, in this case, I definitely am going to be exploring um, mirrors and, um, and sculpture. I started this project when I went to Joe Mitchell. Uh, it was a breakthrough for, this, for the Strange Fruit series. I don't know if you guys can see it because it's like, Let's see, mirror. Um, but basically it's fractal piece and the idea of invisible visibility. So it's the other series that I have, which is based on um, the ambiguity uh, of race. And so I wanted to do the ambiguity of marginalized body types in any space. And so I have about 85 of these different heights um, and they create sort of this the invisible lines uh, going through. And actually, if I can, I don't know if I can do this without, I was gonna share my screen, which is really scary. So I'm not gonna I, do it. I, you're your co-host, so you are able to share. All right, let me, let me go and share my screen. Cool. Hold on a second. All right, let me see if I can do this right. Oh gosh, no, it's not good. Hold on. Uh, let's see. If I can do this. Okay, full screen exit. The little green button on the bottom. 
Yeah, I have that. I just wanted to get the, the right screen up. Oh, yeah. Um, you know. We can't see everything else. Come on. No, not, not, not <laughs> it's just kind of boring. Well, I was going to show you a picture of the, uh, the work. Um, but now, um, hold on a second. It's not, I, I'll, just let, I'll just let it go. We can share it later. Hold on a second. Uh, let me see if I can share. Okay, can you see my screen now, everybody? Yes, I think you can. Okay. So this was the piece. Does everyone see it? Wow, it's stunning. So, yeah, it was easier than I thought. This. <laughs> so this was um, this is called a grove of strange fruit. Oh, and let me do this for Instagram, folks. Let's see if I can. So this is the piece um, that I had up at Project for Empty Space for my solo show. So basically after th two or three years of like really uh, figuring this, sh this out from wood, wood uh, prototypes to mirrors, it became this grove of, grove of strange fruit. So I'm actually making strange fruit into this sort of three-dimensional figure that is then now invisible. So the idea of myself sort of being you know, kind of it, among a herd of our pride of animals or being that pride of animals. So let me just. Um, those are stunning. Did you, are, are those um, CNC router? like um, Laser cut? <laughs> laser, yeah. Yeah, laser cut. So, and then here they are, a different iteration of them at Caldwell University um, uh, with my striped bandits that uh, have the sort of barcode um, insignias on their faces, uh, and then a smaller version of these. So, uh, but this, the, the Grove of Strange Fruits going to now change into other things. So, and let me see if I can somehow get back to everybody. Oh, I just stopped sharing. <laughs> it's like that simple. Okay. Uh, my mother's daughter. All right. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so that's basically the mirrored piece, and I will be doing more with them. Um, it, it may not be this format uh, anymore. It may not be this muse, um, but it will definitely be uh, in my um, visual syntax and language. Let's put this over here. And those large scale sculptures, were those uh, also for sale? Or was that a museum? Where was that placed? Uh, so that was at Project for Empty Space here in Newark, um, their older location at the Gateway Center in Newark. It, Gateway is connected to uh, Penn Station, Newark Penn Station. And uh, that's where my residency was. And then I ended up becoming a renter uh, because of proximity. Um, and uh, I've had a few sales of those. Um, I also worked on a 3D project. I'll, I'll get you that as well. Um, part of my artist residency was to work with the form design studio um, through Rutgers. And so I made a 3D model um, of my head. And it goes along with one of my muses. Um, there are nine secrets and lies that make us best friends, and they all have nine uh, crooked teeth lips. And so uh, as a part of utilizing um, the Form Design Studio as a Newark artist, we got a chance to work with Kiri Rosen, the director, to learn about new, um, new media uh, for artists. So this was, this was one of the things that I had created for the show. It was actually uh, nine inches high and um uh, this was just a prototype a prototype uh and and it sold actually so it's good <laughs> um, Congratulations. so i mean yeah so i mean i could see you know i've always i've always been told that the my work sort of renders or, or kind of announces itself as being sculptural um definitely these sort of large robust bodies uh in space uh, and on two dimensional, it seems, you know, it always seemed to be that, but I never, I didn't want it to like sort of seem like other artists, you know, like Louis Bourgeois or something like that. I mean, in terms of that work. So to kind of make it, you know, my own was something that 
I, I didn't I didn't want it to lend to any other artist. Um, and we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm always about being open to process and materials. So this was a nice, uh, nice part of being an artist in residence through Project for Empty Space and having that ability to, to work with something I couldn't, I didn't have any control over. <laughs> you know, it's all, you know, 3D and then you sit there and you file for, for hours. So, um, but it was, it's really nice to kind of broaden my visual mark making in that way and, you know, be open to those things, so. Yeah, uh, I, just a, uh, I guess a procedural question with the, the, the black ink that you're using or is that black paints on the oh. two paintings behind you? Like, are you using uh, a special type of black ink or are you using India ink or what, what types of materials are you using? Oh, India ink? For yeah. This? Um, the one, uh, this one is gouache uh real uh gouache acrylic and then gouache um for the gold um that's what i'm using with this and um basically everything's water-based i don't use anything that's um that's you know aggressive uh in the studio and um i just use uh you know whatever the the the, the best priced <laughs> watercolor um hobines for my uh gouache um so you know i kind of i kind of just work with with pretty basic stuff um i even use crayon uh pencil uh kind of really plain like really plain with material it doesn't have to be precious material but the outcome can be kind of really precious and fresh and that's what i'm kind of playing with so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so GOT asks, are you using any fabrics or any textiles in your work? Uh, I have done some textiles. Um, I've done, I've made um, merchandise with uh, like shirts and things. Um, I did a couple of those for a holiday uh, fair where I used the strange fruit. Um, and that was really fun, actually very successful. Uh, since I've been here, I've just been focusing on like making. Um, um, but I'd love to work with fabric and incorporate it actually with the drawings uh, in some cases. So we'll see where that goes. Incredible. There's there seems to be a lot of room for experimentation right now. Which is, it's it's yeah, wonderful. I mean, we have time. <laughs> it's like you know, kind of a lot of time. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any questions. We've got about eight minutes until our live studio visit with Shoshana will come to a sad, sad ending. <laughs> but um, um, it's been really wonderful speaking to you today. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I see racks in the background there. Did you oh, build yeah. those racks? Oh so, yeah, I have painting racks that I built and uh, just got um, my books from, well, half of my library, not all of it, but um, painting racks so like you know everything has to be it's really easy so I can like go right to you know a piece and pull it out for you know if there's a, a collector coming by or studio visit everything's really easy to get to um, you know I clean up before people come over though <laughs> it's not necessarily well, thank you all the time um, I was also wondering about uh, another process do you make your two-dimensional work standing up on the wall or in an easel or do you do it flat i paint primarily flat flat yeah um i mean i have done you know for drips and for certain kinds of you know i'll do that or i'll i'll work flat and then pour or pour on top and let it let it sit for a while uh, but no basically i'm i'm here um working at the table here so yeah, and I'll and I'll do like every day when I come in, I'll do a drawing, and I'll just put it aside, and just to like warm up, you know. Um, or I've been going through all my old drawings, and um, I have a whole series called the Blackout Drawings where I've covered up all my drawings that I didn't like, and I did that basically when I moved from a studio in 2016, and then that turned into a series that till today so any drawings that I I call it, it's called the crap drawer I probably didn't see it but I've I've <laughs> labeled one of my flat files 
you know, garbage, what were you thinking? And so basically I take those drawings out and I completely, um, I completely remove its identity. So it's another idea and that act of removing one's, what the image's identity as the maker is about that idea of uh, ambiguity or control, um, censorship. And so that's what that series is about. And it comes into play with um, digital breakdown here. So in digital breakdown, I basically covered up with sort of the old school censorship, censor uh, blocks that they had, you know, back in the 80s and before the digital, but like pre-digital. So it's like this big. And so I wanted to kind of play with that um, in, in this series. And so that, that came um, after uh, sort of painting over 150 drawings that I can see some traces of. So there's a really nice way of like kind of seeing the trace of an image, but then also being the person in control of the, of the image making and also not making it precious. So, which yeah, is really hard. <laughs> really bold move to make. It's a very confident and bold move to make, yet it's also, as you reference, you know, can't take things so preciously all the time and to be able to move forward and letting go. And, you know, there's all this wonderful, um, I suppose artists get to that point because they have to let go of the work that they predominantly, like hopefully sell. Right, but to, but to know that there's a crap drawer and to understand that in your process is really uh, heartwarming and, and, and humbling, you know, for us artists out there that are kind of like, is, is this good enough? Why am I even making anymore? But I did have uh, Charles Mary Kubrick ask on Instagram Live, how do you hang those large drawings? <laughs> uh, with map pins, believe it or not. Um, I get black. Uh, for the for the areas that are black, obviously, and then I get white. And if I have a grid, uh, I'll get matching color, and then I'll put them in like a packet and tell the preparator, <laughs> and I give them the, the right amount. Um, but I just use map pins. They actually they hold up well. I mean, making large work, you know, poses its own problems, right? Uh, framing, who's framing that? Uh, you know, but um, I do like the idea of like, you know, working in the large scale sort of modernist. Uh, style um, and as a woman, there's so much history with women uh, who haven't been who underrepresented in sort of this way. It's sort of like taking over the idea of like make it large, make it big, make it a, it's a for a man, you know, or it's by a man. And so I kind of like want to like, you know, it can be large. And I in graduate school, I made really large work that was heavy. <laughs> uh, and Anyway, we won't even get into that, but, <laughs> but um, you know, this I can roll up and put into a sonotube and send over and, you know, it can be hung up. Um, and why not? I mean, I've sold large work before and um, people love it and, you know, that they, I will work with them on, you know, how to frame it. I don't do the framing, uh, but, you know, I kind of give them uh, criteria or like what I like. Uh, and, you know, a lot of artists, a lot of collectors do a lot of with payment plans. So I'm good with that, too. Like, uh, I think that's, you know, a lot of um, a lot of artists selling out of their studio don't realize they could do a payment plan, you know, make like, okay, well, maybe every month, just give me so much. And then at the end, it's yours, you know, and, um, and I could even, you know, suggest a framer. I have a you know a local framing place so so I even reach out and get like a job for a small mom and pop framing as opposed to you know going to one of the larger outfits in Long Island City or something. So yeah, payment plans are a real thing. Uh, you know, not paying everything up front. If another a uh, couple questions before we wrap. Yeah, sure. uh, someone's asking, is there a standard size of paper or work that you prefer to work on and also what kind of paper do you use or prefer? Sure, I use BFK Reeves Arsh. Um, I love 30 by 22. I love 24 by 18. Um, these are, oh gosh, uh, 120 pound Arsh um, uh, and they are uh, cold press. So I like the texture um, or it's, you know, basically what's the best deal? <laughs> like what, what role can I afford? Oh, and make sure it's the same size and color, you know, that, okay. So, you know, um, yeah, that's 
I mean, I like standard sizes because standard sizes means they can buy a frame and put it into a frame or I can buy a frame and I can frame it and then I'll add those costs in. Um, so, but that's kind of my go-to. I also work on clay board um, as well. And I love clay board. It's highly addictive. Uh, I think the art supply store saw me coming and they were like just pulling box. Like when I had grant money, they were just like, you want, you want two boxes? Like from the street, they were just getting it out for me. Um, and I like clay board because it's ready to hang. You just, I make cleats for them and they go right on the wall. Um, so there's something about that. I'm thinking about that too, accessibility for the work, like how easy it can just get into someone's hands, you know? Um, and also deferring to gallerists about their clients and what their prices should be. I think that it's really important. A lot of artists have this like idea of like, oh, it's gotta be this much money. And for me, I go in and my most successful relationships with gallerists have been, what's your market like? Who are your collectors? What sells at this price? Tell me. And if I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know, and so I'd rather it go into someone's home than come back to me, um, you know. Yeah, you, you only have so much storage. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other the city. That's, that's like a therapy session story. <laughs> right. like the whole thing. Well, Shoshana, I don't know if you have any last uh, words you'd like to share with this incredible group of uh, individuals that met with us today on Zoom and certainly going strong on the IG uh, while we uh, close up here. Well, I just wanted to say there the last week or the week before, um, there was a comment about what post COVID world's going to be like. And it's going to be like art fair. It's going to be like the app. I mean, you know, it's going to, in some ways, you guys are doing that ahead of time. <laughs> you know, the idea that artists are joined and they have like this collective and they have uh, people backing them and supporting them and, and um, promoting them. And I think that that's something that's going to be, that you guys are doing that first. <laughs> um, so much they, didn't pay, they didn't pay me to say that. Pay me. No, they, we really <laughs> did. <laughs> that's badass, Suri. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely like how I see this, the art world and how we're going to be doing this. You know, and this has actually been the thing that's been like every Thursday. This has been great. Thank you so much. It's really so fun talking to you and learning more about your process, some of your secrets, being able to see the work in your studio, where you make it. Uh, it's really been great talking to you, Shoshana. Thank you again for being here. And for those of you that are still here next week, Thursday at six, we'll be talking to Tahir Karmali, who's got a whole new series out of his COVID angst as well. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking more about uh, what it's like to feel locked down as an artist and uh, just the market today. Shoshana, thank you so much. And for those of you who came in late, we always record these and then um, I'll get them put up on the Art Fair YouTube channel within the next uh, 48 hours or so. All right. Thank you so much, Carolina. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Art Fair. Um, it's great to see the community. I hope to yeah. see you guys. <laughs> yeah, going strong. Yes. All right, everyone, stay safe. Bye, everybody. Bye.